thank you, Oksana. I'm going to discuss uh, today just one of the aspects of women, Ukrainian women political prisoners' uh, everyday lives in the uh, in the camps and prisons of the Gulag. And this today's paper is a part of a larger research project focusing on really different different uh, aspects of the women's lives in the camps, including. Um, their uh, arts and crafts and their um, uh, femininity practices, uh, their motherhood, the personal relationships, and so on and so forth. So this is just one uh, one part of the wider research. And to be honest, my, my research is probably the first one trying to somehow to reflect and to analyze the women's, the Ukrainian women's experiences uh, in the Stalin's uh, gulag. So obvious, for obvious reasons, it could be I imperfect in many ways, uh, but this is just the first attempt. And I am aware of only one substantial research on women's experiences in the gulag, uh, that one of Catherine Jalak, uh, Identity in Exile, researching exploring Polish women's lives uh, in there. So, I'm not going to discuss here what is Gulag and what was its history and structure and so on and so forth. What is important for me, uh, this is the very dramatical, very drastic um, demographical change which happened uh, to the population of uh, Gulag prisoners during and after the World War II. And here are some data which show that the number and the share of uh, political prisoners and the number and share of Ukrainians, of people of Ukrainian ethnic origin, and also the number of women increased drastically during the uh, wartime period and after that. So it allows me, you know, somehow to justify why I focus specifically on that period of time. And what is also important that uh, during that period, uh, women who found themselves in the camps and prisons. The, the great majority of them were women somehow uh, who come from a Western Ukrainian region and who have been accused or, uh, of uh, alleged or real collaboration with uh, nationalist underground. So many of those women were of uh, peasant origin coming from countryside, uh, very religious women uh, for whom uh, Christianity was like integral part of their identity, of their personality, and corresponding practices were also very normal part of their daily lives. So for them, their religion was very dear, and they were not prepared to give up in the Gulag, although all the religious practices and activities and accessories or the items of religious meaning have been pro prohibited in the, in the camps and uh, taken away during the searches. So uh, I will, in this paper, the several uh, manifestations of women's religiosity in the Gulag uh, are discussed, and it those includes individual prayers and some visions, or women report or uh, on uh, having these prophetic dreams uh, and visions of Virgin Mary or the Christ bringing the good news, and also uh, they practiced group prayers and even organized and conducted the improvised divine services and masses. They celebrated the major Christian holidays. They uh, produced uh, handmade items for personal spiritual uses, uh, usage, ex exactly because those have been taken away on a regular basis, so they have to refill. And I, uh, the paper discussed also the role of embroidered icons and memorabilia for kids and the family. So it's rather obvious that women who faced the powerful and merciless uh, repressive system, they have no, no other you know, agent to turn to, and they appeal to the God as a supreme authority, asking him for endurance and strength to, to survive, to uh, actually to, to be able to go through all those challenges. Um, uh, so they ask it for, for that. And there was a kind of a cult of uh, Our Lady or a Virgin Mary because women 
Uh, in Western Ukraine, it's very popular, though they perceive it, uh, her to be an advocate specifically for women's issues, for family issues, and they um, uh, trusted our, uh, our Lady their burdens and their uh, griefs and their anxieties, so it worked like a kind of therapy for them, and they asked for protection and guardianship uh, and the self-conciliation uh, from Virgin Mary too. Um, despite the fact that there are those women, imprisoned women, living on the verge of death in terrible inhumane conditions, uh, they had no time, they had no tools and no materials for uh, embroidering, for any type of um, uh, crafts. Despite all that situation, the uh, embroidering uh, obtained uh, unprecedented uh, prevalence in the camps, and uh, many of those uh, embroidered items survived exactly because they, they've been made of clothes, which was relatively easy to hide on the body or among the personal belongings, and relatively rarely found during the searches. So, um, of course, those icons, uh, they have rather modest aesthetic value, and they barely are, you know, canonical in their interpretation of of, uh, of images, uh, but uh, for those women, the, the meaning, the significance of those items were qu quite uh, uh, substantial because for many that was the only religious thing they've been able to have, to, to, to keep. And the handmade items for personal spiritual use included, first of all, rosaries or beads made of, uh, usually made of uh, black bread. And for me it was quite, uh, quite a, a revelation that, you know, in camps, women actually starved, and um, they were hungry all the time, and the bread was the most valuable thing in the camps, and they used bread to make those rosaries. That means that their uh, spiritual needs were more important than their need for food. The group prayers, uh, women prayed in group, in groups, especially for uh, to somehow to help other women who suffered the most during the interrogation in investigation prisons, or if some one of them was uh, very uh, ill and sick because they believed the prayer the, 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 to increase, in fact, they accumulate the effect of the prayer. Uh, they conducted also improvised uh, secret uh, uh, Sunday messes on a regular basis, and many actually. Too many women reported on that, so they organized, they uh, reconstructed the script of the mass and then tried to conduct the service and also the holiday services, performing the, lo the, the, the roles of a priest and a deacon. So for me, it's quite impressive um, um, moment in, uh, in, the, in this experiences of those women because it turned out that Women who were deprived the most, deprived of all the rights, possibilities, and resources, under these strange circumstances, they obtained these uh, emancipatory experiences. So they tried on the roles, otherwise unavailable for them and prohibited for them. So they served as priests. Uh, women celebrated Christian holidays and virtually in, in uh, every testimony uh, on uh, prison experiences, on camp experience, women recalled those instances of celebration. And for them, it happened to be very important to prepare for a holiday, and that preparatory time was uh, very significant. It mobilized women, they accumulated the food stuff, and they tried to make some basic attributes from whatever was available. Um, put in barak in order, and they created that very special festive mood, which was very important to som somehow to generate positive emotions, which were kind of alien to the surrounding where they found themselves. And they tried to make some holiday meals or substitute of holiday meals, so the holiday was conducted um, following the traditional holiday customs. And Many women actually mentioned it, not only those of Ukrainian origin, but many 
of those who were of German or Polish or Jewish origin or even Russian, that women, Ukrainian women celebrating their Christian holidays invited other inmates, regardless of their uh, religious affiliation, to join the celebration. And embroidered memorabilia, again, towards the issue of the role of <laughs> embroidery in the, in the captivity, <coughs> many of those uh, uh, embroidered items survived and they served as letters or messages to their kids. Quite often they featured an angel uh, who was entitled, symbolically entitled to, okay, to, uh, to be a guardian for kids left behind to take care of them, and they also uh, served as a kind of talisman to protect the kids because they've been invested with this prayer. And many, actually, many of those, me sorry, I did something wrong. Goodness, oh, here we go. And many of those with memorabilia actually contain the inscriptions, uh, kind of a prayer, uh, a request to uh, Our Lady, uh, to take care of the kids and to protect them and to save them until the mother is back. So, and coming to my conclusions, th this is just one example how women articulate the, the meaning of uh, Christian uh, faith and practices in the, in the captivity. So, the conclusions. So, I would say having a closer look on women's religious practices and faith in in, in the, during the imprisonment, it allowed women to reconnect to the native culture um, because from which they've been uprooted and somehow to restore that feeling of belonging to that imagined community of which they've been taken away. Uh, that also helped them celebrating uh, Christian holidays and having these weekly services on, on Sunday uh, helped them to structure the time flow, which in the camps was very monotonous, and uh, each other day was uh, similar to the previous or to the next one, and it uh, sometimes it uh, turned the life in the Hulag kind of pointless. They've been disoriented. It helped them, of course, to keep the, the presence of mind and emotional stability in the context where depression and despair um, uh, often apathy and the suicidal thoughts were not a, a rare guest. Uh, they uh, also, those Christian practices helped to maintain a feeling of inner freedom. So women felt that the regime cannot control them totally and there is something they could practice despite all the prohibitions. So they felt that they remain uh, um, uh, free from inside. Uh, they practiced their normative femininity while preparing for the Christian holidays and uh, during the embroidering because that those were like the normal uh, part of the, of the normative femininity script to be a good um, housekeeper, to be a good housewife, to prepare to, to practice, to be a Christian, practicing, practicing Christian and so on and so forth. They tried on the clerical roles, which is quite... Uh, a, a revelation for me. They maintain traditional, traditional value system and withstand the dehumanization because in the camps it was too easy to degrade to the level of um, uh, just survival at any cost, so they tried to maintain the moral norms. Um, uh, they generated positive emotions, which was very important uh, to somehow to find the the meaning of life and to survive and to keep up with the hardships and they, uh, those practices always promoted solidarity. And the most important for me is uh, the point that I would consider those religious practices in the Gulag to be a kind of uh, non-violent resistance to the regime because it actually undermined the very fact that the regime can totally control the prisoners despite the, the life in the camps was uh, like ordered and there were rules and regulations and prohibitions but in fact those practices show us that not everything was under control so the control was not total and the repressive system was not that total and efficient thank you